Hi everyone, I wanted to do what I feel is a much needed video explaining the basics of operant conditioning to help people understand how certain training methods actually work in terms of how the horse experiences them and how they affect behavioral change in the horse. I find that there is a lot of misunderstanding in the horse community on how the training methods we use work and how the horse learns from them. A lot of us are told what to do from our instructors, but we aren't really told why we are doing it. And that can lead to a lot of confusion. And it can also lead to frustration when we're exposed to the realities of how certain methods work. So before we get into this, what I want to clarify is that a lot of instructors in the horse industry, while they might have a lot of clients and they might have been riding for a lot of years, they're not necessarily behavioral science professionals and they might not have any education on behavioral science and therefore might not actually know how the application of their methods is actually functioning in terms of how the horse's brain is receiving it and learning from it. So. There tends to be a lot of misinformation passed around the horse world where people will be told conflicting things from their instructors and then when they are exposed to different information it leads to confusion. So what I want to make clear is that there is currently no requirements for horse trainers and riding instructors to have a basic understanding of operant conditioning and behavioral science. So they may be teaching things incorrectly and it doesn't mean that their version of it is correct. The information that I'm going to give you here is science-based, and this is a science that has been studied for a number of decades now. And how operant conditioning works is actually very simple in concept. It just gets muddled in how people explain it and how people want to feel about what methods that they apply. So operant conditioning was first brought about by B.F. Skinner, who some people may have heard of. And to simplify the definition of it, it's essentially a theory of learning where behavior is influenced by consequences. So the consequences vary in what type of consequence they are. There's punishers and there's reinforcers. So punishers by default always discourage the reoccurrence of a behavior and reinforcers by default always encourage the reoccurrence of a behavior. So you reinforce the behaviors you want to see reoccur and punishers are meant to discourage behaviors from happening again. Now, between those types of consequences, you have positive and negative. To simplify it, what these mean is that positive is the addition of a stimulus and negative is the removal of a stimulus. They do not refer to good or bad. So in reinforcement, we have positive reinforcement and we have negative reinforcement. Positive reinforcement is the addition of a stimulus that the learner likes and wants to have in order to reinforce a behavior. It has to be something that the learner finds valuable and wants, otherwise it's not going to be reinforcing. So for example, if you're trying to reinforce your horse and you're trying to feed them something that they do not like, it's not gonna be reinforcing to them even if another horse likes it. So positive reinforcement is what is associated with rewards-based training or clicker training, and the consequence that you're giving for the desired behavior is a pleasant one that the animal wants to have and finds valuable. So most times this is going to be food because this is the highest value reinforcer that you can give in this context with most animals. However, you can also use scratches and tactile touch in certain situations, but it tends to not be as powerful as food. And once again, it has to be a type of touch that the learner enjoys and wants to seek. If they don't find it enjoyable, it's not going to be reinforcing. And then we have negative reinforcement. This is the most common type of reinforcer in the horse world. Negative reinforcement is the removal of an aversive stimulus to reinforce a behavior. Aversive sometimes gets confused with abusive. They're two different things. Something can become so aversive that it is abusive, but aversive at its core just refers to something that the learner finds unpleasant and would prefer not to have around. So it can range from being mildly annoying or irritating, slightly uncomfortable to extremely uncomfortable, stressful, etc. The reason why it has to be aversive is that the removal of that stimulus is what is reinforcing the behavior. If it was something that the learner wanted to have around, the removal of it wouldn't be reinforcing. It would be punishing to them if it was something they wanted to see. To put it in a human-centric context, it would be like if you're playing on your phone and someone takes your phone away and you want to have that phone, the act of it being taken away is actually going to be punishing. It's not going to be reinforcing. So by default, negative reinforcement is reliant on the removal of an aversive stimulus. In horse training, a lot of people refer to negative reinforcement more colloquially as 
pressure and release. An important thing to note is that not all tactile pressure is aversive. So it is perfectly possible to teach tactile pressure cues using positive reinforcement. And in that case, when you remove the pressure, the pressure is never aversive. So the removal of the pressure is just cessation of the cue itself. It is not the same as using pressure and release in the sense of negative reinforcement. This is something that a lot of people get confused about, but there is a big difference between an aversive pressure being removed to be reinforcing the behavior and a tactile cue stopping the application of it once the cue has been answered by the learner. So not all pressure is aversive. It is how you use the pressure to train that defines that. Hi, it's Shelby from the future here. I just wanted to add further clarification. If you're training a tactile pressure cue with positive reinforcement, what it will look like is taking a previously neutral pressure, aka a pressure that the horse would just ignore until you put it on cue, and then pairing it with a cue. So for example, if I add leg pressure that's light enough that my horse would ignore it in any other context, but I pair it with the horse following a target stick forward, and then make it a tactile pressure cue that's associated with forward movement as a result, then that's how you would teach a pressure cue with positive reinforcement. However, if you're just using the application of pressure to teach the cue, for example, you add leg on and you keep that leg on or you keep increasing the level of pressure used until the horse steps forward and then you remove it, then that would be using pressure and release, aka negative reinforcement. Hope that clarifies. Punishers. Same thing as with reinforcers, positive refers to the addition of a stimulus and negative refers to the removal of a stimulus, not good or bad. So positive punishment is the addition of an unpleasant stimulus that the learner does not want to discourage a behavior from happening. Negative punishment is the removal of a stimulus that the learner would like to have around as a means of punishing an unwanted behavior. So positive punishment in the horse world more commonly will be things like whipping the horse, hitting a horse in the nose for biting, but it can also be like yelling at them, backing them up suddenly, chasing them in a circle, doing things that they find highly aversive, scary, unpleasant, uncomfortable, painful, etc., to discourage a behavior. The learner is what defines what is and isn't punishing. So certain horses might find certain stimuli punishing, even if other horses may not. But if you are using them to discourage a behavior and you're applying a stimulus to discourage a behavior and it actually works, then it is fair to say that the learner found that punishing. Negative punishment is the removal of something the learner finds valuable. So for example, if they find your presence valuable, if a horse is getting all up in your space and you exit the field or exit their stall and just walk away, that could be viewed as a type of punishment, as could removing food. Now, the problem with punishers is that they only tell the learner what the incorrect answer is. They never tell them what the correct answer is. So punishers are behavioral suppressants and positive punishment is particularly problematic from the standpoint of it's using the addition of an unpleasant, fear-inducing, stress-inducing, pain-inducing stimulus to discourage a behavior from happening. All it is doing is targeting the unwanted behavior. It's not addressing the reason why that behavior exists. So the problem with this is that if you're not addressing the underlying motivation behind a behavior, you're highly likely to cause the learner to develop a different type of behavior to take the place of the previously unwanted one. And what this does is it can increase what we call follow up behaviors, which are the result of certain behaviors and coping mechanisms being punished away so the learner selects a new one. The new one could be as unwanted or even more unwanted. So the problem with punishment being a behavioral suppressant is that it doesn't actually get to the bottom of why these behaviors exist. And if you address the underlying cause of a behavior, the behavior itself will rectify. So for example, if your horse is biting you because they're ulcery and frustrated, if you treat the ulcers, they're not gonna have a reason to bite at you anymore. So what you can also do instead is you can do what's called differential reinforcement of an alternative behavior, which is a behavior that typically conflicts with the unwanted one. And you can reinforce that so that the animal is more likely to engage in that behavior than the unwanted one. And this can be a really favorable way of addressing unwanted behaviors after you've dealt with the underlying cause if the animal is still displaying them out of habit. So amongst the punishers, positive punishment is the most problematic in terms of welfare because of how powerful of a behavioral suppressant it is and it also induces fear and stress. This is applicable to all species, it's not just applicable to horses where positive punishment has a high risk of follow up behaviors and it can also increase reactivity, chronic stress and also can increase aggressive behaviors. So it's discouraged by most behavioral professionals because of this. There are other better means 
of handling unwanted behavior that don't have the same risk factors. And unfortunately, the belief of this truth is not well accepted in the horse world. A lot of people view it as impossible to discourage unwanted behavior without use of punishment when that is not at all true. There are lots of ways to discourage unwanted behaviors without use of punishment that are more successful long term and also far more kind to welfare. The other risk of behavioral suppressant is that you can suppress certain warning signals before you get larger reactions. So for example, if you get mad at a horse for displaying any type of aggression signal like pinning their ears at you or snaking their head at you, then you could suppress those warning signals and they can go straight to the final act which could be biting you. Or you could suppress warning signals that a horse is getting overwhelmed and then they can just explode out of nowhere. The other risk factor for positive punishment is that it can cause learned helplessness which is a depressed state of being that results in the animal not interacting with their environment in a normal way. They stop interacting and trying to engage with the environment and shut down. It is not a good state of being for a creature to be in, both for welfare, but also because it stops the outward signals of them interacting with their environment and being aware of what's going on. And if they come out of learned helplessness because the stress that they're handling internally becomes too much, oftentimes there's this rebound effect where they explode much much more and are more reactive to a stimuli that they might be able to ignore or at least react smaller to in other situations because they haven't been storing this chronic amount of stress. So that's your crash course on operant conditioning. The most relevant ones in terms of what we see the most common in horse training would be negative reinforcement and positive punishment. Negative reinforcement is not my preferred reinforcer from the standpoint of it's a lot more ambiguous. When you're just releasing pressure after the horse gives you the desire response it's not as clear to the horse what the exact correct answer is especially when you're doing things like trying to teach certain body postures under saddle there's a lot more ambiguity to the horse as the learner whereas positive reinforcement with a bridge signal which is like saying like yes or like clicking the clicker when they do what you want and then reinforcing with a reward that the horse finds valuable it tells the horse the exact moment that they have done the right thing and it's much much more clear in addition to using a type of reinforcement that the horse wants to seek so you tend to get horses that are much more engaged in training and want to seek the right answer rather than horses who are just seeking avoidance of something that they they do not like and that is why it's my preferred reinforcer. I don't think that negative reinforcement is abusive to horses. I think it can be used abusively but you can also use positive reinforcement coercively by withholding food and getting a horse to come into training when they're really really hungry and desperate for food which is also problematic. So what I would say is that in trying to create a partnership with a horse, using reinforcers that they find valuable and want to have is going to feel more favorable and nice to them than using reinforcers that they by default want to avoid. So at minimum, what I would encourage people to do is to try to use more rewards in their training. You're better off adding some rewards and still using negative reinforcement than you are offering absolutely no incentive other than the removal of an aversive stimulus, especially if you want your horse to have a really favorable perspective of training. The last example that I'll draw for like negative reinforcement just to kind of help people understand how it might feel to the learner is it's essentially like if someone in your house is nagging you to do something like do the dishes and they're tapping you on the shoulder and going do the dishes do the dishes do the dishes and they might get louder and escalate in their level of intensity over time if you don't do it they might start poking you harder they might start jabbing you in the ribs they might start raising their voice and yelling and they keep at you until you do the dishes you're going to be relieved when you go to do the dishes because the parts of their behavior that have been annoying you will stop but you're not going to feel like happy and good about it whereas if someone handed you like a five dollar bill or your favorite food every time you did a task for them you're going to have a different more positive perspective towards that task and this has been shown in behavioral studies i can do another video discussing the differences in learning styles and how the horse response to training between positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement this video is going to be too long if I do that so I'll do it in a different one if people are interested comment below and let me know and I can talk about the science that is there but these methods of reinforcement have been studied across multiple different species with very very similar results so it's safe to say that the outcomes cognitively are very similar across species the idea that horses only learn from pressure and release is completely false. There's no evidence that there is truth of that. In fact, the opposite holds true in both anecdotes and study. If horses only learn from pressure and release, you wouldn't be able to teach them anything with positive reinforcement, but they are 
massively capable of learning from positive re reinforcement. So what I would encourage people to do is just be mindful of how your training is working. Be mindful of what factors of operant conditioning you're using on your animals so that you can understand the outcome behaviorally for them and how they might feel about your method of training as well as the risk factors. It's important to be aware of how the training you use works and make decisions from an educated basis rather than believing it works differently than how it actually does and making decisions from a place where you're not actually sure of what you're doing. There's tons of both free and paid learning resources on operant conditioning and how it works, both pertaining to horses and other animals. And you can also look up lots of studies on scholarly search engines such as Google Scholar, Science Direct, etc. Um, I also have more in-depth videos on my Patreon where I talk about specific training concepts at length and I also do tutorial videos and you can subscribe to my Patreon at the link down below. I also have pre-recorded webinars on my website that you can purchase and view that go into detail on these training concepts as well as others depending on what you're looking for. There's some on horse behavior as well and then there's lots of resources all over the internet that you can use. But anyways, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Comment below your thoughts and any questions you might have or any future video suggestions and I appreciate any and all support. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out my merch and anything else in the link down below if you want to know where else to find me. So thanks. Have a great day, everyone.